Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the theater. Let us talk about a common expression, being afraid of the dark. It feels timeless, doesn't it? Though the literal interpretation is enough to bring about memories of childhood anxiety at night, the metaphor is just as rich. The absence of knowledge or information being left in the dark. When we are, it is tempting to grasp at the nearest explanation, if only just to lend the affectation that we have adequately diagnosed a problem or a fear. An example can be as grand as existence or death itself, the seemingly inexplicable nature of our very being here. Or it can be as common as the origin of diseases. For so much of human history, that mechanism was as mysterious as anything. Either way, securing an explanation brings about catharsis, whether it be founded in reason and proof or not. Sometimes it even comes wrapped with an antagonist, a culprit who's brought it about. How many catastrophes, tragedies, or fatal illnesses have been blamed on the devil or evil spirits throughout history? What do you think? Would it be in the millions? The billions? Other times, it has nothing to do with an antagonist, but a sin or fault in the individual that must be purged. Purity made synonymous with solutions. It's almost as if it is embedded in human nature, this intense curiosity that we almost don't care what the reason or origin is for our questions or problems, only that we can get an answer, and soon. Whether it be for that magnificent existential anxiety brewing within our very morrow, or for a common stroke of bad luck, if we spill our expensive latte, an astrologist might suggest that Mercury is in retrograde, a Hindu may point out that it's merely karma for wrongdoing in your past life. Whatever answer we have found or think we've found, that alone is sometimes enough to cease the suffering, or at least give the illusion that we are not sitting all alone in the dark. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Near the centre of Suffolk, England, is a small village called Wattisham. The year was 1762, and one Reverend Bones was polishing his spectacles in the quiet of the church's back room. Flames danced in his glasses, his gaze lost in the hearth fire fighting back the winter chill. The heat wrapped around his legs, the wood popping and sizzling as, just beyond the stone walls, the village stirred to life. Like the wintry breeze howling along the stained glass windows, some stories come and go as soon as they arrive, and without ink and paper or murmurs to carry them along from one person to the next, they are irredeemably lost. This story would not be possible without Charlton Wollaston, a 29-year-old who had just been appointed physician to the Queen's household. A flurry of dark layers, the physician let himself into the church and called out for Reverend Bones. He spoke of a family of eight in the village, a man and wife, and their six children. The Reverend was familiar. He had just baptized their youngest in November the previous year but the expression on the physician's face was one of despair. It was Sunday, January 10th, when the eldest daughter, Mary, complained of severe pain in the calf of her left leg. In the low light of sunset, her forehead slick with sweat, she looked up at the young physician desperately. The rest of the family was gathered around her in the cramped living room of their home. It is like being gnawed on by dogs, she said. Having given her something for the pain, Wollaston left, hoping it was nothing more than a severe ache, a lack of sleep or proper nutrition, perhaps. The father, John Downing, was only a poor laborer on a nearby farm, and the family could not afford much in the way 
of comfort. But that very same evening, Wollaston was called back. Another daughter, Elizabeth, this one ten years of age, now complained of a similar pain. Like Mary, there were no visible signs, as though a phantom was digging into their legs and feet. Regardless of the cause, Wollaston sensed that the family was in great peril. His optimistic side hoped Elizabeth was experiencing sibling jealousy, wanting as much panic and attention to be afforded to her as was Mary. But that optimism was quiet, very quiet, indeed. By morning of the following day, the mother and father and yet another child were also in pain, a pain also in their legs. Thus, Wollaston left the home that Monday morning shaken, and found himself seeking solace in Reverend Bones. Without a medical explanation, Wollaston hoped to secure a spiritual one, or perhaps even just a second opinion. Thus, the Reverend agreed to accompany him to the home. But the situation would be far worse than either could have anticipated. On Tuesday morning, the entire family suffered the same affliction with even the infant now exhibiting signs of being in pain. As the days wore on, the whole neighborhood would become aware. It would be impossible to ignore, in fact. They heard the moaning and agonized cries from the home. But it would be no exaggeration on behalf of the family. It was then that their limbs began to show visible signs. Blue spots appeared first, as though they had been bruised. Those blue spots then blackened turning whole portions of the leg gangrenous. At last, a familiar sign, if not an utterly disheartening and shocking one. Between four and six days after the initial complaints, the limbs had mortified completely. Nowadays, we use that term to express embarrassment or deep shame, but then it was a common medical term for the death of tissue. Mary, the first to be afflicted, was also the first to experience the devastation of a mortified limb. Her very flesh began to peel off from the bone, and then, without any need of surgical instruments, her foot came off at the ankle, leaving the leg bone utterly bare and simply sticking out of the healthier flesh above. It was not long until the rest of the family followed soon after. I'm afraid the details are too copious to be talked about in detail, so please enjoy this painful list. Her mother also named Mary aged 40, lost her right foot at the ankle. Her left leg, too, was entirely mortified, leaving only bone. Elizabeth, 13 years old, had to have both her legs removed below the knees. Sarah, a 10-year-old, lost a foot at the ankle. Robert, an 8-year-old, also lost both his legs below the knees. Their second youngest, Edward, 4 years old, lost both his feet below the ankles, and the family infant, only 4 months old, perished. Let us just pause to fully take in this scene, what may be unimaginable to some listeners. The sheer number of surgeries that had to be performed, or the horror of having avoided one, instead finding that a foot or a whole limb simply detaches without the aid of so much as a scalpel. The imagery is plucked straight from a nightmare, to see parts of oneself rotting away before one's very eyes, and with such great speed that there is little to be done, and no explanation in sight. It was John Downing, the father, who escaped with little damage. He experienced numbness in his fingers, which then became stiff and useless, but nothing more. The reverend suspected nothing foul, when asked if witchcraft might be the explanation, but he was unconvinced. There was not a spell or a demon to be found in sight, just bad luck, and a purely material explanation, still being scoured amongst physicians now sharing opinions and investigating the case more thoroughly. The family did experience some relief. After the amputations and surgeries, the pain lessened and the mortification appeared to stop. All that was left was to discern the reason for the calamity, but the father, Downing, was unconvinced. Being a laborer on a farm and having seen the irregularities in crops and animal health, he knew the power of witchcraft and the true destruction that a single, mischievous evildoer could commit, so long as they were party to the devil. Amongst all that tragedy, to be left nearly unscathed 
was surely a sign from God to take matters into his own hands. And if the physician nor the reverend suspected a culprit, he would find one. In town, there was an old woman named Ellen Harding. Having survived a similar, albeit far less dramatic, sweeping disease in her small family, she was left alone to her own solitude. She had aged considerably since then, and being none too social, as soon as any misfortune struck the village, there were often whispers that she was at the heart of it, a prime subject for accusations of witchcraft. After all, how many rumors were there of woodland beasts taking up residence in her home, or the incantations of spells she cast deep into the night? Rural towns like Wattisham, England, in the 1700s were breeding grounds for paranoia. In the heart of that rustic lifestyle were dreadfully long and hard winters, where darkness blossomed with all manner of ill imaginings, and at the forest edge, nightmares manifested where the rotting corpse of a critter denoted something sinister at play, and the meowing of a house cat in the middle of the night the first hints of a cursed harvest. Such an environment spun devils from silence and malicious plots out of mere suggestion. And John, under no spell but his own fear, having watched his family suffer and his own infant die, would seek to right a wrong with no purpose. He turned his eyes, to the cottage of Ellen Harding, the only home with its windows still lit late into that evening on January 21st. Taking a hand scythe with him, John stormed Ellen's home and accused her of witchcraft. Even in that very moment, he said, the effects of her spells were at play, turning the legs of his children into mere bones and bloody stumps. Perhaps the reverend was blind, he continued, but he saw her for what she was. With wrathful tears budding at his eyes, John did something that surprised even him, what was made all the easier for having not listened to her short protests nor her denials of guilt. He lashed out at her neck with the scythe, like the blood that spilled from his children's legs during their amputations. Ellen's throat poured and spattered a grisly amount. It scattered upon the ground, on his clothes. It hissed in the fire and gurgled at her skin. In the brilliant amber light of her hearth, it glowed and bubbled forth like its own liquid flame. John wiped it from his eyes to see her last moments clearly. The elderly woman stumbled from her chair, falling hard to the ground, with her head landing in at the edge of the fire, where her hair and the rest of her body quickly began to catch. John was left in the odd silence of what he'd done. Though it would be far from quiet, his body trembled, his heart pounding in his ears as though he was beneath the crashing waves of a temperamental sea. He stood still in that quiet, watching the flame spread across her clothes, her body, and igniting on a nearby stack of tinder. The sound of the blood slowly dripping from his scythe was drowned by the ravenous flames. Ellen's death would no doubt be a terrible tragedy, but having received so much attention and sympathy from the village already, none suspected John or any family member of his to be a culprit in the murder. In fact, nobody was suspected of murder. The fire was thought to be merely an accident, conveniently eliminating all evidence. In the coming weeks, Wollaston and the Reverend continued to investigate the cause of the mortification. They looked into the family's diet, their beds, and really any part of their daily lives, confused as to how no one else in the village was afflicted. During regular checkups, the physician was pleased to see that the family was in surprisingly good spirits after the ordeal. Spring was just around the corner. Everyone was getting on well. This next portion is taken directly from his accounts. One boy, in particular, looked as healthy and florid as possible, and was sitting on the bed quite jolly drumming with his stumps. Then Wollaston noticed the wheat they used to make their bread with. It had been cut during a rainy season and laid on the ground till many of the grains were black and utterly decayed. 
a blackness that the family had recognized well in their own bodies. Urgot. That's precisely what it is. And the doctor was happy to tell them. A parasitic fungus had infected their wheat, giving it a blue-black hue, which contains toxic chemicals. Yet unlike many toxins, it couldn't be neutralized through the heat of the baking process. Ergot is remarkably resilient, and will survive not only being baked, but it can even be transferred from mother to child via breast milk, which explained away the death of their infant. Everyone in the family was relieved to hear this news. They wouldn't have to suffer the horrors any longer, so long as they avoided the grain with such color. It was only the husband, John Downing, who did not appear so elevated from discovering what had affected his family. In fact, his expression seemed to sag and shrink, and even a light perspiration started at his forehead. Soon everyone took notice. Having observed the sweat, the doctor handed him a handkerchief and asked him, is everything all right? Thank you for joining me for another episode of Mania. Before we get into the facts and fiction behind this story, I'd like to personally thank the sponsors of this show, which are you, the listeners. Patrons who support Mania receive exclusive goods, content, and if you'd like to join that club, you can go on over to patreon.com forward slash harlequin grim. And if you would like to support our theater another way, go to thegrimtheater.com where you'll find a selection of gothic and dark art by our very own Astrid Grimm. As for everybody else, just your listening and sharing of the content and enthusiastic engagement online, I am more than honored to have you here. Now, let's get back to the story. After a long while of giving you stories that were entirely non-fiction, I'm happy to say that the dreadful mortification of the Downing family was heavily tampered with. But some details were not, and it might surprise you. The fittingly named Reverend Bones was actually his name, and the physician, too, was also a part of history, as was the entire family and every last detail of their illness. However, as you might have guessed, there was no Ellen Harding and thusly no murder for which John Downing might get his vengeance, and then a horrible shock of regret. That part was entirely fictionalized, but he did in fact suspect witchcraft. Perhaps the strangest bit about this story is that he was alone in this hypothesis. During a time when such accusations were thrown about with abandon, Reverend Bones kept a remarkably cool head, and left it to the physician to discover the source. Good on you, Reverend Bones. That brings us to the source. Though it really was the ergot in the grain, and it was suspected by the doctor, it was never nailed down. At least not in this instance. A previous paper, published in 1719, essentially documented a case that was precisely the same, only the scale was much larger, and the culprit was found to be the same. Once they had eradicated it from the diet, it stopped. Nevertheless, perhaps Wollaston was vocal enough about his suspicions that the family stopped eating the grain because, lo and behold, after six months, they were entirely free of the disease. Sadly, the eldest daughter, Mary, did pass away from complications, and though unrelated, the young physician did also die just two years after as well. So you see, though the individuals were left in pieces, it really was a happy ending after all. Sort of. Thank you once again for joining me for another story. As always, the theater is ever open to you. <laughs>